And now to the outcome of the high-profile criminal case that attracted international attention. The case itself may be coming to an end, but questions about how it was handled continue. Three months after he was arrested on charges of sexual assault, Dominique Strauss-Kahn was greeted with boos when he arrived at a New York City courthouse this morning. But inside, the former head of the International Monetary Fund got some good news. The sexual assault charges against him had been dropped. Prosecutors asked state Supreme Court Judge Michael Obis to drop the charges because they said the defendant's version of what happened was not credible. Whatever the truth may be about the encounter between the complainant and the defendant, our inability to believe the complainant beyond a reasonable doubt means that we cannot in good faith ask a jury to do that. And so we arrive at the recommendation that we make here today. Moments later, the judge formally ordered the dismissal of all charges. The case began in May when Strauss-Kahn was pulled off a plane and arrested after a hotel maid at the Sofitel accused Strauss-Kahn of sexually assaulting her when she arrived to clean his room. Defense attorneys asserted all along that any sexual contact was consensual. But the case began to unwind when prosecutors reportedly lost faith in the accuser, Nafisatu Diallo, an immigrant from Guinea. In July, prosecutors said she told inconsistent versions of events following the alleged attack and made a number of false statements about her past, including an apparently phony account of a past gang rape in Guinea. I want justice. I want him to go to jail. As it became clearer that the Manhattan District Attorney was likely going to drop the case, Diallo went out to speak to reporters to plead her case. I had made a mistake, but this man tried to rape me. After today's ruling, Strauss-Kahn's lawyer Strauss said the decision the was the right one. This is a horrific nightmare that he and his family um, have lived through. You can engage in inappropriate behavior, perhaps, but that is much different than a crime. And this case was treated as a crime when it was not. But Diallo's lawyer criticized the district attorney for deciding to drop the charges and vowed to push forward Good with afternoon. a civil case. Could an immigrant woman from Africa come to this courthouse and get justice when she says a powerful, wealthy man attacked her? Apparently, the answer is no. But we will stand by Mr. Diallo to the very end. Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance was about to talk to reporters about the case when he was interrupted by the East Coast earthquake. Strauss-Kahn himself addressed the media outside the townhouse where he stayed this summer. It's the end of a terrible and unjust ordeal. I am relieved from my wife, my children, my friends, all those who supported me during this period. I want to return to my country, but I still have to take care of a few things before I leave, and I will speak for longer when I return to France. This afternoon, an appeals court denied Diallo's request for a special prosecutor, meaning Strauss-Kahn will now be able to leave the country. We take a closer look now at some of the questions surrounding the way this case was handled. Allison Leota is a former federal prosecutor for the Department of Justice. She also served as an assistant U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C., where she specialized in prosecuting sex crimes and domestic violence. She's now a novelist. And Christopher Coots is a professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley, where he teaches criminal law, among other areas. He spent much of the past year as a visiting professor in France. Professor Coots, were you surprised that this case that began with such an outburst of publicity and the arrest of a powerful man ended this way, without a trial? Uh, I think everybody was shocked by this case. I remember the thunderclap uh, of the announcement in early in the morning in France in May when he was arrested. This was the man who would, was likely to be the next president, and suddenly the political system was upended, followed by the next great shock at the end of June when the, uh, the DA announced that the case was essentially collapsing. I think from the end of June to now has been pretty, uh, pretty predictable. But uh, it, certainly, it, uh, it certainly is a, a shock, given the certainty with which the, the DA announced uh, the charges against uh, Mr. Strauss-Kahn back in May. 
Allison Leota, is it unusual for a case to get to this point and then simply not proceed? It is somewhat unusual. In the ideal world, you want to know everything there is to know before charges are brought. You, you know, making the decision itself to charge is one of the most important decisions prosecutors can make, especially in a case like this, a sex crime, where merely leveling the charge can ruin his life. So ideally, you would know everything that they now know before you make the charging decision. And so it wouldn't be done in this manner, where an indictment has been brought, and now they have to dismiss a case against the defendant, but they would have found this out beforehand. But on the day of the arrest, Dominique Strauss-Kahn was already on an airplane getting ready to cross the Atlantic and return to his own country. Do you think that imminence might have forced the prosecutors to move more quickly than they might have otherwise? Absolutely. I think they all must have had visions of Roman Polanski dancing in their head. The producer, the French producer who ran from sex charges in the United States and fled for 30 years. France doesn't have an extradition treaty with the U.S. and those prosecutors must have been thinking, I, do, am I going to be the person that let this guy get away? Am I going to be kicking myself over this for the next 30 years? Um, that said, there are a lot of differences. You know, Strauss-Kahn had a house here in D.C. He was the head of the IMF base here in D.C. And he was, you know, probably going to run for France uh, for the French presidency. So it's unlikely that he wouldn't return to the United States. Professor, there was evidence of a physical encounter, and that part was agreed to by all the parties. But the story diverged right at that moment. Both people involved said two very different things happened in that room, and they're the only ones who know. Is that what makes prosecuting sex crimes difficult? It makes prosecuting crimes like this difficult. And I should just say, we don't—Dominique uh, Strauss-Kahn has not said what happened in that room. His lawyers have suggested that it was an encounter consistent with consent. But we, uh, he hasn't given a positive story of what's happened. The only story we've seen is the story by his accuser. Uh, but uh, in a case like this, where the physical evidence doesn't show, doesn't on its own show force, as the physical evidence here didn't, then it's a very difficult case. There are no other witnesses. It really does come down to a, a question of the credibility of the complainant. Was Nafisatu Diallo, in your view, Professor, treated fairly, treated decently for someone making a complaint of this kind? I think she was treated extremely fairly at the beginning. There's evidence that she was her complaint was taken as seriously as it could possibly be, and I think that's a tribute both to the professionals in law enforcement, and I think also to a generation of particularly feminist legal scholars and activists who've made uh, who've changed the way in which we understand the the charge of rape. I don't know what happened in those interviews. One of the things that's interesting in the memorandum that the DA re released yesterday is the anger that comes out against her, that she repeatedly lied to them in interview after interview. They're clearly, they clearly became very upset with her during the course of this interview. They indicate they would have understood lies in the past, but not uh, what seemed to be a deliberate attempt to fudge the facts going forward. If that's the case, if there, if the memorandum that the DA released and talked about yesterday it shows what really happened in that room, then I think, again, she was treated fairly by being discredited. That's a very troubling circumstance. You just heard the professor refer to the changes in the way these cases are brought. You've been inside the system. Has there been a shift away from the old days when a woman might have been under attack from the get-go and questioned? as to why and wherefore uh, in, the, in the encounter with a man, to almost the burden being on the other side now. There's definitely been a shift. There used to be laws in the book, even just a generation ago in the 60s, that said that it, you couldn't bring rape charges if there was only the victim coming to te forward to testify. There had to be corroboration from another eyewitness. Now, obviously, it's not the type of crime that takes place in crowded restaurants. So that alone took out a lot of the rape cases that might have been brought. So things like that have been going to the wayside. And you don't hear folks saying um, these days so much, what, you know, look at what she was wearing. She must have asked for it. She must have wanted it. Um, at the same time, you know, when victims come forward, they are trusted, they are believed, but the prosecutors must look and see where they're coming from. It, what are her reasons for getting into the case? What, is she coming forward because something terrible happened to her and she wants to tell the truth and bring justice? Or is she coming forward for other reasons, to get money or revenge or, or any number of reasons? So it, it's really incumbent on the prosecutors to find that out beforehand. Well, demonstrators throng the court in New York today, um, accusing the system, basically, of prosecuting the victim rather than the accused. 
Uh, is that the kind of thing that's a risk for an elected district attorney? Well, it's true. For, for an elected district attorney, he, he's everything that he does is going to be under a microscope, and he's, he's going to have to show the people that he's trying to get elected by that you know, he can do the job. But I, I think that it is absolutely part of the job for the prosecutor to be fair. They're not just trying to win a case. They're trying to do justice. They're, they have an obligation not only to the victim, but to the defendant as well, to be fair and to look into what actually happened, what is the truth of the matter. And that's a special role that prosecutors have that other lawyers around the country just don't have. And, and that's what they did in this case. And it, it does add a level of scrutiny to the victims uh, of the sex crime. But on the other hand, in fairness to everybody, it's something that absolutely has to be done. Pro uh, professor, how about that obligation to the defendant? Was Dominique Strauss-Kahn treated fairly in this case? I think in the end he was treated fairly. Uh, he got a chance to present uh, his defense, at least indirectly. I think at the beginning, uh, fr people in France, I think around the world, were horrified at, the, at his treatment at the, the famous perp walk, uh, at um, what seemed to be a uh, 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 sort of the real, uh, real rush to uh, try him in the court of public opinion. And for that, I think there's really no excuse. I think that uh, it's not that he was necessarily treated differently than certainly any other celebrity defendant, but uh, it's a kind of treatment that I think we shouldn't support in the American justice system. I think the, uh, the creation of the media circus around these very serious criminal cases just leads to uh, unpleasantness everywhere. Professor Kutz, Allison Leona, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Ray.